Thanks for listening to your local NPR club. at the rate of 20,000 gallons an hour. Understand, but the difference is that I am now able to strike back. I apologize, I have a mic, but for some reason it's not con connecting very well. But hopefully, you can hear me okay. Can both of you hear me? Yeah, I've got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Charles, did you want to start? Um, yeah, my I I I um I was quite surprised that the TED that I could research through interviews or it, the the only interview with him on YouTube where you hear him speak, uh, the diaries that were available and the volume of material that was available on 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 TED, I was quite surprised how different the previous portrayals of him had been. To what appeared to me to be a more accurate picture of him and in talking to tony i think we were on the same page with that it was, it was kind of like no one's really captured this guy properly although there have been some versions of his story told in the media no one's really done it as accurately as it seems quite obviously just as basic as like well how he speaks what his accent is like and then as we went we just you know we had a very um we had that same perspective it was like let's let's unravel this guy and see what was there and try and sort of capture him as realistically kind of as we could with some degree of obviously stylization on top. You know, we've seen so much content that seemed to oversimplify the story, you know, and, you know, Charlotte and I both realized how much more was there. You know, uh, we had tens of thousands of pages of his diaries to look through and really understand the person. And the more we dug, the more interesting the story got. You know, I mean, literally until the, almost the last day of filming, we were still finding out new information that we wish we could put in, you know. So it's a very deep, dynamic tale that we just kind of wanted to get right and really sort of get the balance of this guy, you know, and not have sort of uh, these simple, simplistic vilification serial killer that we're used to seeing and thinking that if we felt that way, others probably feel that way too. And let's just make this film we want to want and see if others are interested. Well, no, good point. I mean, s sound is so crucial to the movie because obviously that's what really drove Ted Kaczynski mad. So we really needed to hear sound the way he heard it, you know, which was that it was over amplified, you know, um, and, you know, in a way, is it louder than it probably was? Of course, you know, but if you're obsessed with it, you hear it a certain way. So really wanted to have the sound be as, you know, subjective as possible, you know, that you would, you know, you, you'd hear it you know, from where Ted was in the land, but also hear it at this sort of more grading level than maybe you and me would hear. So, you know, a lot went into that, you know, but then also to contrast that with the beautiful nature, you know, the, you know, the, the idyllic part. So have that sort of schizophrenic part or, you know, the sort of schizophrenic, you know, uh, uh, look at deep, you know, industrial sounds with, with euphoric nature sounds. Um, and just kind of strike a balance and then have this sort of sonic overload of music that 
Ted Kaczynski liked the Baroque mixed with this kind of oversaturated, you know, synthetic analog sound that was, you know, um, the soundtrack that was the emotive part to kind of reinforce, you know, what Ted was feeling. Very much for me, that was a reason to make the film, was I realized how much technology is in control of my life, how little there is that I can do about it. Um, I had, I'd had shortly before the movie, I had a friend of mine, you know, tell me that something, I think it was around 2012, the first time that the number of suicides in the globally eclipsed the number of uh, deaths by murder or warfare or basically human on human violence. And now it's something like four or five times higher. It's like two and a half million people killing themselves and like half a million people dying, you know, in, 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 in conflict and war and, and violence. So our society is not happy, you know, globally. That's just like some, you know, I don't know what the latest global numbers are, but those are some of the figures, the, the ballparks. And so there's definitely, you know, as much as everything's gotten better and everything's gotten easier, somehow we're not happier. And that's an interesting question to ask why yeah um and i think to that too just you know the, the you know the environmental degradation we're going through you know um and sure it's one man who's you know upset by what's going on in his backyard but you know the scale of the actual environmental degradation that's happening worldwide right now and you know the climate cliff we're about to go off of you know this this story has become far more relevant you know and the fact that we are you know, his ideas about technology eventually controlling us, you know, I think that has happened, you know, um, and I think, you know, we're just, it's been a slow incremental uh, acceleration of technology ruling our lives that in a way 30 years ago, we would have never accepted. But the fact that it's been slowly creeping up on us, you know, we're locked in in the system that uh, has a lot of issues and uh, creates a lot of unhappiness. You go first time. <laughs> you want me to pick one? Um, I would pick, I mean, I'd pick five. How about five? I'll do, uh, well, let's see. Um, and maybe they're all kind of make their way into Ted Kaczynski. But uh, let's see, Blade Runner, Heat, Taxi Driver, The Shining, Barry Lyndon, and that's, uh, and Repo Man. So. I, I was going to say like uh, the one that leaps to mind for me is Dead Poets Society. Just in terms of the effect that it can have, I saw that movie change my father's whole life, like his career and everything, because he was an educator. And it moved him to that degree that, that it kind of really changed his life. So, uh, and for me, it was just, um, it, it, it's that, that uh, carpe diem, you know, um, uh, uh, make your lives extraordinary, seize the day, boys, make your lives extraordinary. You know, the whole idea that you're going to be fertilizing daffodils, that scene is just, entrenched in my mind i think about it often you know you have a very short time here and it's like it's going to be over like this and as i'm leaving uh tony very quickly don't you think barry linden is the most underrated stanley kubrick film because i whenever i see that, film, that film but everyone gets mad at me and no i totally agree i mean people people i i don't i don't know what it is i mean that's just uh yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if they have the patience for it. I mean, but um, I, you know, in, in a way, it's my favorite, you know. Um, but obviously, you know, every one of Kubrick's films are, you know, rewatchable. And in a way, that's the goal of films. And all those films I've listed are rewatchable cinema. And uh, yeah, no, Barry Lyndon is an absolute masterpiece. So then should I, before, after this, should I go see Peter on the Farm? Because I'm really excited to watch that doc. Is that one of the reasons why you wanted this collaboration just to, to pop off? I, I definitely thought, you know, Peter in the Farm was profound. And I thought this is, you know, it was just, it was, it was very good moments and intensity. And there was an intensity to it, which I related to, you know. And, um, yeah, definitely, definitely check it out. Thank you guys so much for your time. And it was, by the way, Peter in the Farm was sort of, uh, you know, a training ground for this Ted Kaczynski tale. You know, the, the nonfiction, you know, uh, version. Okay, I can't wait to see it. Thanks again so much for the time. And I really love the film. Sure, thank Thanks, you. Greg.